readings of the Bible in one year. July 18th, Judges chapter 1, Acts 5, Jeremiah 14, and Matthew 28. <clears throat> Excuse me. I have a little cold thing going on here. Just letting you know ahead of time in case it gets weird. Okay, um, so we're starting over in the book of Judges. This is my only warning, my only statement. I kind of touched on it before. Um, whereas most books of the Bible have some sort of redeeming quality through the text, the redeeming quality through uh, Judges is the um, statement that without God, we are largely destitute, and that um, if we try to live our life on our own, um, or if God were to withdraw his, his leading and healing hand from our lives, everything falls apart. This is a practical um, demonstration of the book of Ecclesiastes played out, which if you remember when we went through Ecclesiastes, that's the story of, of Solomon looking at life for what it's like for people who aren't, uh, well, today we would say Christians, but then people of Israel. <laughs> the, 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 the life for people um, who don't have Yahweh as their God and what it looks like. This book is the practical um, exercise in those things being laid out. It starts off all well and good, but it quickly falls apart. Let's go ahead and read the introduction. Judges is named after an interesting collection of individuals who led Israel after Joshua's death until the rise of the monarchy under Samuel, about, sorry, up to about 1050 BC. In this time of national decline, despite their promise to keep the covenant, as we just read in Joshua 24, the people turned from the Lord and began to worship other gods. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. This is a statement that's repeated throughout this text. A pattern repeats throughout the book. First, the people abandoned Yahweh. Second, God punished them by raising up a foreign power to oppress them. Three, the people cry out to God for deliverance. And four, God raises up a deliverer, or judge, for them. The author of the book is unknown, although some Jewish tradition ascribes it to Samuel. We're going to see this play out time after time after time as we read this book. And it's a good thing to know that ahead of time. Um, I've known many people who have struggled while reading this book, um, looking for the, the little golden nuggets of, oh, well, this person served God and everything went well. There really isn't that in this book. There's little tiny things that you can find. But God uses strange things in this book. Uh, the, 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 the statement about Deborah, who we're, we're going to come across later, uh, her and Barak. Um, Barak is the one chosen by God to lead the people. He is chosen to be the judge of the people. But he won't do it unless Deborah, a woman, comes with him. He's too afraid to serve God alone. So as a punishment against Israel, their judge is a woman. Now, this may sound, oh, this misogynistic and blah, blah, blah. Read through the rest of Scripture. You'll understand why that's such a, an affront to the people at the time. So, that's the issue. It's, it's not just little things. It's, when it starts off, it's all well and good. The people are trying to do their best. And, you know, we, 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 we're nice to them because they're trying. They're at least trying, right? Um, toward the end... They get angry with a judge for coming up because they're, they don't want, want to rock the boat anymore. And they, at the end of the book, they're just kind of living in their depravity and dealing with the consequences of it. 
the last like five or six chapters are some of the most horrific things you'll read in all of Scripture. And I've talked about this before. There are some things written in Scripture that are merely descriptive. It's not prescriptive. Like David uh, cheating with Bathsheba and then uh, killing his um, longtime friend and husband of Bathsheba. This is not prescriptive. It's not Scripture telling us that's what we must do, even though it was King David. There are descriptive things and there are prescriptive things. This book is descriptive. It's telling us about a thing that happened. It's revealing to us the heart of humanity without God. And it's some of the hardest things you're going to read. Like I said in the beginning, it's not so bad. It's just as we get deeper in. Let's begin. Now it happened, after the death of Joshua, that the sons of Israel asked of Yahweh, saying, Who shall go up for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? And Yahweh said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have given the land into his, uh, into his hand. Then Judah said to Simeon his brother, Come up with me into the territory allotted to me, that we may fight against the Canaanites, and I in turn will go with you into the territory allotted to you. So Simeon went up with him. So Judah went up, and Yahweh gave the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hands, and they struck down ten thousand men at Bezek. Then they found Adonai Bezek in Bezek and fought against him. And they struck down the Canaanites and the Perizzites. But Adonai Bezek fled, and they pursued him and struck him, sorry, and seized him and cut off his thumbs and big toes. And a, Excuse me, and Adonai Bezek said, Seventy kings with their thumbs and big toes cut off used to gather up scraps under my table, as I have done, so God has repaid me. So they brought him to Jerusalem, and he died there. Then the sons of Judah fought against Jerusalem and captured it and struck it with the edge of the sword and set the city on fire. And afterward, the sons of Judah went down to fight against the Canaanites, living in the hill country, and in the Negev, and in the Shephelah. So Judah went against the Canaanites, who lived in Hebron. Now, the name of Hebron formerly was Kiriath Arba, and they struck Sheshai, and Achaman, and Talmai. Then, from there, he went against the inhabitants of Debir. Now, the name of Debir formerly was Kiriath Sefer. And Caleb said, the one who strikes Kiriath Sefer and captures it, I will give him my daughter Aksa as a wife. Then Othniel, the son of Canaz, Caleb's younger brother, captured it, so he gave him his daughter Aksa as a wife. Then, rather, now it happened that, that when she came to him, she enticed him to ask her father for the field. Then she alighted from her donkey, and Caleb said to her, What do you want? She said to him, Give me a blessing, since you have given me the land of the Negev. You shall, rather, so you shall give me also springs of water. Negev is a desert region. So Caleb gave her the upper springs and the lower springs. Now the sons of the Canaanite, Moses' father-in-law, went up from the city of Palms with the sons of Judah to the wilderness of Judah, which is in the south of Arad. And they went and lived uh, with the people. Then Judah went with Simeon his brother, and they struck the Canaanites living in Zephath, and devoted it to destruction. So the name of the city was Hormah. And Judah captured Gaza with all its territory, and Ashkelon with its territory, and Ekron with its territory. Now Yahweh was with Judah, and they took possession of the hill country, but they could not dispossess the inhabitants of the valley, because they had iron chariots. Then they gave to, uh, Hebron to Caleb, and Mos, rather Ad, as Moses had promised, and he dispossessed from there the uh, three sons of Anak. But the sons of Benjamin did not dispossess the Jebusites who lived in Jerusalem. So the Jebusites lived with the sons of Benjamin in Jerusalem to this day, or they have lived there to this day. Likewise, the house of Joseph went up against Bethel, and Yahweh was with them. 
And the house of Joseph spied out Bethel. Now the name of the city formerly was Luz. Then the spies saw a man coming out of the city, and they said to him, Please show us an entrance to the city, and we will treat you with loving kindness. So he showed them the entrance to the city, and they struck the city with the edge of the sword. But they let that man and all his family go free. So the man went into the land of the Hittites and built a city and named it Luz, which is its name to this day. But Manasseh did not take possession of Beth Shean and its uh, and its towns, or Tanakh and its towns, or the inhabitants of Dor and its towns, or the inhabitants of Iblium and its towns, or the inhabitant the inhabitants of Megiddo and its towns. So the Canaanites persisted to live in the land. And it happened when Israel became strong that they put the Canaanites to forced labor. Remember, they were supposed to utterly wipe them out. But they did not dispossess them completely. Also, Ephraim did not dispossess the Canaanites who were living in Gezer. So the Canaanites lived in Gezer among them. Zebulun did not dispossess the inhabitants of Kitron or the inhabitants of Nahalal. So the inhabitants, rather, so the Canaanites lived among them and became subject to forced labor. Asher did not dispossess the inhabitants of Akko or the inhabitants of Sidon or um, Alab or Akzib or Helba or Afik or Rahab. So the Asherites lived among the Canaanites and the inhabitants of the land rather the inhabitants of the land, for they did not possess them, or rather dispossess them. Naphtali did not dispossess the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh, or the, or the inhabitants of Beth Anath, but lived among the Canaanites. See how the wording is different here? They're living among the Canaanites. The Canaanites are not living among their land. This is both the same for them, uh, and also for... Um, that's the Asherites, and... I think the the Zebulonites and also Naphtali and I think the Danites as well. Continuing on. So the Asherites lived among the Canaanites, uh, the inhabitants of the land, for they did not possess them. Naphtali did not dispossess the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh or the inhabitants of Beth Anoth, but lived among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land. And the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh and, the, and Beth Anoth became forced labor for them. Then the Amorites pressed the sons of Dan into the hill country, for they did not allow them to come down to the valley. And the Amorites persisted in living in Mount Herez in Aijalon and in Sha'alabim. Uh, but the hand of the house of Joseph became heavy, and they became forced labor. Now the border of the Amorites ran from the, the ascent of um, Akrabim, from Selah, and upward. Now Acts chapter 5. But a man named Ananias, with his wife Sapphira, sold a piece of property. Remember, we've read about this before. At the end of chapter 2, when all the people were, uh, rather, at the end of chapter 1, when everybody was selling things and, you know, taking care of one another, here at the end of chapter 4, we had the same thing again, where all the people who had any property or anything were selling it so that they could give money to the church, and the church would take care of anyone who had need. Again, this isn't just rank communism. What we have instead is that as people became Christians— they were cut off from their families, cut off from their jobs, cut off from the sanctuary. They were cut off from all of the things, and the people uh, would typically not even acknowledge them any further. The minute you became a Christian, you would lose everything. So for a lot of these people, they were, as, they become, as they became Christians, very many were in need. So this is what people were doing. They were selling so many things that they had because they just didn't need it anymore because they were going out to the mission field wherever they had need. So this is where we are now. But a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property and kept back some of the price for himself, which is perfectly fine for him to do, right? With his wife's full knowledge and bringing a portion of it 
this is important, he laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back some of the price of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not under your authority? But why is it that you have laid this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. And after, as he said these words, Ananias fell down, dead, and breathed his last, and great fear came upon, or rather came over all who heard. Well, does this mean God's going to kill you if you uh, don't give every penny you have to the Lord? No, it's entirely up to him, but he's lying to them. He's saying, here's this piece of land that I sold for, um, I'll use today's money, right? If you sell a, a, a couple acres of land, I don't know. I don't know what land costs. Um, we'll say you, you sold it for $100,000, right? But you're keeping back some of that for yourself. So you're giving 75% to the church, $75,000. Cool. But you're going to the church and you're saying, ah, I sold a land for $75,000. Here's all of the money because they're seeing everyone else doing the same thing. But they're lying to God. Because this is a devoted thing. We've read about this before. Devoted things belong wholly to God. They made a promise beforehand when they were going to sell it that they were going to give all the money to the church. And now that they've sold it, they're like, that's a lot of money though. I want to keep some of it back for myself. Well, they had already made the promise. They had a devoted thing. And they weren't delivering the full devoted thing to God. When we see um, in the Old Testament... As the laws are being um, given to the people, right? Um, There's a lot of very hard lines that are shown. And there are signs that are given and tests that are given to the people. Like there's a um, very early on, after the Sabbath rules are set, a guy is found out picking up sticks on the Sabbath. They're like, that's a work. He's not trusting in God to meet his needs. He's out picking up sticks. It's not like there's just a bunch of sticks laying around. He's picking up sticks to you know, make a fire and take care of things. But you're supposed to trust in God. So what happens to this man who's out picking up sticks? I'm trying to remember. I don't remember if they stone him with stones or if they burn him with fire. One or the two. He dies. And I think his family dies with him as well. This is stating these things very early on. These are the rules, and then everything else follows after that. And these type of things that happen are the same type of things we see here. Now, today, if you go to your church, right, um, and let's say that your church has a building project that they're doing, and, um, you know, the, the, the Spirit presses upon you to give something, you remember, oh, yeah, I've got that car that I never use. And you tell the church, oh, you know what? I got this car. I never use it. Um, why don't I sell it? And then I give you all the proceeds and you can use this for, for whatever the building ministry is that you're doing. For whatever the thing happens to be that the church needs. And you go out and you sell it. And you, it turns out that this car that you thought was only worth a couple grand is worth like 10 grand. So you give the church what you thought it was worth, the couple grand, you keep the rest for yourself. Is God going to kill you? Maybe, but probably not. However, he will use this as a teaching thing for you later on down the road. But it also reveals the sin of uh, covetousness and the sin of greed that is within your own heart. God blessed you by finding out that this car was worth far more. And so, when you sell it, you've already promised all of it goes to God. That blessing goes to God. And so, give it to God. That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying that God's going to kill you if you do anything like this. I don't know that he will. He might. It's God. He could give you cancer. I don't know. We've seen him do this kind of thing before. But... What is shown here, this is, a, um, this is an example of the act of God through this new fledgling church. 
This is why everyone noticed it, and 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 fear fell or fear filled their hearts. There we go. This isn't well impartially. Yeah, they're terrified, but also they're terrified of God. God is the one who has done this. It's not that that Peter had the power to cast a you know you die now and you know God immediately kills him. Um, he's just notating. You haven't lied to us. But as David says in Psalm 51, you've lied to God. You've sinned against God, and this is what happens. Continuing on. Verse 6. And the young men rose up, wrapped him up, and after carrying him out, they buried him. Now, there was an interval of about three hours, and his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter responded to her, tell me whether you were paid this much for the land. Or they agreed together, that's what they're going to do. They're going to lie to them. And she said, yes, that much. Then Peter said to her, why is it that you have agreed together to put the spirit of the Lord to the test? Behold, the feet of those who buried your husband are at the door, and they, were, they will carry you out as well. And immediately she fell at his feet and breathed her last And the young men came in, found her dead, and carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came over the whole church and over all who heard these things. Now, at the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were happening among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's portico, Solomon's porch. But none of the rest dared to associate with them. However, the people were holding them in high esteem. And more than ever, believers in the Lord were added to their number, multitudes of men and women, to such an extent that they even carried the sick out into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, so that when Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on any one of them. And the multitude from the cities in the vicinity of Jerusalem were coming together, bringing people who were sick or afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all being healed. But... The high priest rose up and those with him. That is the sect of the Sadducees. They didn't like any of these miracles happening because the sect of the Sadducees does not believe in miracles or angels or anything that happens after death. And they were filled with jealousy. This is making them look bad. And they laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the prison and, taking them out, He said, go, stand, and speak to the people in the temple, the whole message of this life. Upon hearing this, they entered the temple about daybreak and began to teach. Now, when the high priest and those uh, came, rather, and those with him came, they called the Sanhedrin together, remember that ruling class of the the Jews, Um, this is the the council that kind of rules over all of Judaism. Even all the counsel of the sons of Israel. And they sent orders to the jailhouse for them to be brought. But the officers came and did not find them in the prison. They returned and reported back, saying, We found the jailhouse locked quite securely, and the guards standing at the doors. But we opened it and found no one inside. Now when the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them as to what would come of this. But someone came and reported to them, The men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the captain went along with the officers and proceeded to bring them back without violence, for they were afraid of the people, that they might be stoned. And when they had brought them, they stood them before the Sanhedrin, and the high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly commanded you not to, teach, uh, not to continue teaching in this name. And yet, you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and intend to bring this man's blood, Jesus, is upon us. Right. But Peter and the apostles answered and said, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you put to death by hanging him on a tree. It's like, yeah, you want, we're bringing his blood on you because you're the ones responsible. 
This one, God exalted to his right hand as a leader and a savior to grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God gave to those who obey him. But when they heard this, they became furious and intended to kill them. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, respected by all people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and gave orders to put the men outside for a short time. And he said to them, Men of Israel, take care what you propose to do with these men. For some time ago, Theodos rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a group of about 400 men joined up with him. But he was killed, and all who were following him were, were dispersed and came to nothing. After this, uh, after this man, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew people away after him. Well, he too perished, and all those who were following him were scattered. So in the present case, I, I say to you, stay away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan of, or action is of men, of humans, it will be overthrown. But if it is of God, you will not be able to, ov- to overthrow them, or you may even be found fighting against God. So they followed his advice, and after calling the apostles in and beating them, they commanded them not to speak in the name of Jesus, and then they released them. So they went on their way from the presence of the Sanhedrin, rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for the name, the name of Jesus. And every day in the temple, from house to house, they did not cease teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Christ. Let's move on to Jeremiah 14 now. That which came as the word of Yahweh to Jeremiah in regard to the drought. Judah mourns, and her gate Uh, Her gates languish. They sit on the ground in mourning, and the outcry of Jerusalem has gone up. Their mighty ones have sent their underlings for water. They have come to the trenches and found no water. They have returned with their vessels empty. They have, uh, rather, they have been put to shame and dishonored. They covered their heads. Because the, the ground is dismayed. For there has been no rain on the land. The farmers have been put to shame. They have covered their heads. For even the doe in the field has given birth only to forsake her young, because there is no grass. The wild donkeys stand on the bare heights, and they pant for for air like jackals. Their eyes fail, for there is no vegetation. Although our iniquities answer against us, O Yahweh, act for your name's sake. Truly, our acts of faithlessness have been many. We have sinned against you. O hope of Israel, its Savior in time of distress, why are you like a sojourner in the land, or like a traveler who has pitched his tent to lodge for the night? Why are you like a man confused? like a mighty man who cannot save. Yet you are in our midst, O Yahweh, and we are called by your name. Do not leave us. Thus says Yahweh to this people, Even so they have loved to wander. They have not kept their feet in check. Starting over, Even so they have loved to wander. They have not kept their feet in check. Therefore Yahweh does not accept them. Now he will remember their iniquity and punish their sins. So Yahweh said to me, Do not pray for the good of this people. When they fast, I am not going to listen to their cry. And when they offer burnt offering and grain offering, I am not going to accept them. Rather, I am going to make an end of them by the sword, famine, and pestilence. This right here is the first time that it's going to be mentioned, but it will be repeated throughout this book. The sword, famine, and pestilence, the threefold destruction of God. Destruction through war, destruction through um, lack of rain and starvation, 
and destruction through pestilence, which is disease and death. Verse 13, but, ah, Lord Yahweh, I said, behold, the prophets are saying to them, you will not see the sword, nor will you have famine, but I will give you true peace in this place. Then Yahweh said to me, their prophets are prophesying lies in my name. I have neither sent them nor commanded them nor spoken to them. They are prophesying to you a vision of lies divination, futility, and the deception of their own hearts. Therefore, thus says Yahweh concerning the prophets who are not prophesying in my name. Although it was not I who sent them, yet they keep saying, yet they keep saying there will be no sword or famine in this land. By the sword, rather by that sword and famine, these prophets shall meet their end. The people also to whom they are prophesying will be thrown out into the streets of Jerusalem because of the famine and the sword, and there will be no one to bury them, neither them nor their wives, nor their sons, nor their daughters, for I will pour out their own evil on them. And you will say this word to them, Let my eyes flow down with tears night and day, and let them not cease. For the virgin daughter of my people has been shattered with a mighty shattering, with a sorely sick wound. If I go out to the field, behold, those slain with the sword. Or if I enter the city, behold, distra- sorry, diseases of famine. For both prophet and priest have gone uh, around as merchants in the land that they do not know. Have you completely rejected Judah? Or have you loathed Zion? Why have you stricken us so that there is no healing for us? We hoped for peace, but there was no good. And for a time of healing, but behold, terror. We know our wickedness, O Yahweh, the iniquity of our fathers, for we have sinned against you. Do not despise us for your name's sake. Do not disgrace the throne of your glory. Remember and do not break your covenant with us. Are there any among the the idols of the nations who give rain? Or can the heavens give showers? Is it not you, O Yahweh, our God? Therefore we hope in you. For you are the one who has done all these things. Now, the conclusion of the book of Matthew, or the gospel of Matthew. Now, after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn uh, toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. And his appearance was like lightning, and his clothes as white as snow. The guards, quaked from fear of him, became like dead men. And the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He is not here, for he has risen. Just as he said, Come, see the place where he was lying. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. And they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to report it to his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and report to my brothers to leave for Galilee, and there they will see me. Now, while they were on their way, behold, some of the guard uh, came into the city and reported to the chief priests all that had happened. And when they had assembled with the elders and uh, took counsel together, they gave large sums of money to the soldiers and said, You are to say, well, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this is heard before the governor, 
We will win him over and keep you out of trouble. And they took the money and did just as they had been instructed. And this story was widely spread among the Jews and is to this day. But, hold on, I'm making sure I don't lose our notes here. There we go. But the eleven disciples proceeded to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had designated. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been, past tense, already given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to keep all that I commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Bringing up the rest of the notes here for you. They are fantastic in this section. I would strongly recommend pausing and reading through all of them. And that is it. All right. Whew. I love the Gospels. I really, I know it sounds dumb to say that, but I really, really do. All right. That is all for today. Um, that's, again, all the text and all the reading. God willing, we'll be back tomorrow. Behold the word of the Lord.